So, good morning, everybody. Uh, when, I, when I found out I was speaking at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, uh, I thought there's, there's just going to be nobody there, especially when I saw uh, the big party that was being had last night. So I think it, it says a lot about the do lectures that, uh, you know, there's so many people here this morning, which is fantastic. Um, I'm going to uh, be speaking to you uh, about growing your own veg this morning, which is a uh, subject very, very close to my own heart. Um, and I suppose just to give a bit of background, I think like a lot of people here uh, this weekend, I, um, you know, I, I worked in the IT industry for, for about 10 years and um, you know, made, made a, a pretty uh, major life change about five years ago, gave it all up to do something that I, was, that I loved and was passionate about. Um, and I set up, set up an organization called Grow It Yourself to get people uh, you know, fired up about growing vegetables to hopefully um, help them to do it more successfully. Um, and basically we've gone from, you know, in two years uh, from just one group uh, in Waterford where I, where I live to uh, now 100 uh, GIY groups around, around Ireland uh, and about 10,000 people involved in, that, in those two years, which is just amazing. Uh, this photo was taken um, last weekend. Every, every, every harvest time, every September, we have an event uh, where we bring all, you know, people together from, uh, from all over Ireland, and we call it The Gathering, which I think is a, a lovely name for what we do to bring people together. It's sort of similar to the Do Lectures uh, without the naked saunas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And um, we decided at the end of the day, we were, you know, all feeling very euphoric. We try and recreate the kind of Beatles Abbey Road uh, uh, album cover. And as you can see, we, we completely failed to do that. <laughs> uh, you know, apart from the fact that there's four guys in the, in the photo, that's about the only similarity. And it was only afterwards when I looked at it, this, this incredible guy from Kilkenny made these signs for us uh, with our logo on it, the GIY logo. It was only when I looked at it afterwards I realised my sign is pointing in the wrong direction. You know, so, <laughs> so it's uh, you know really alarming when the, the, the founder and leader of an organisation is you know is is pointing in the wrong direction effectively, <laughs> and um, maybe it has something to do with my kind of uh, egomania that I'm you know pointing at myself. <laughs> thought about that, or maybe it's about you know swimming against the tide or some other some other cliche, but. Uh, yeah, that that's, hasn't worked out very well. I started um, growing my own food because I'm a stubborn git. And basically, um, you know, what, what happened to me was, you know, it always amazes me that, that, and you heard this so much this weekend as well, that so many people's lives just change because of a very banal, um, uh, although life-changing moment. And the same thing happened to me. Uh, in a supermarket in Waterford about five years ago where I was doing my, you know, doing a bit of shopping, uh, about to throw, you know, the little nets of, of gar three, three bulbs of garlic that you see in the supermarket. I was about to throw that into the, into the trolley and I noticed on the back it said that it was a product of China. Or actually I think what it said was a touch of China was the brand, which I always think is some, some great marketing there. Um, and basically, you know, I just, this was just my, my road to Damascus moment. I think it was the fact that it was, it was China, you know, 10,000 kilometers away. Um, something so small and so cheap, I think it was 40 cent uh, is what it was selling for. Uh, and, and, you know, if it had been Holland or Spain or something else, it mightn't have had such a big impact on me. So, again, because I'm a stubborn git, I, I kind of asked to speak to the manager. Uh, I can be kind of contrary. Uh, sometimes and so this guy comes out and he, he comes over to me and I could see by him that he was just really pissed off about this you know he was looking at his watch I'd say he was you know finishing up his shift uh, shortly thereafter so I said to him you know why are we why are we buying uh, importing garlic from China and uh, he basically turned around and he said to me that's just the way things are and I think we heard this yesterday as well with, with in Christiana's talk that's just the way things are. So I, I kind of felt that, you know, the only thing I could do, um, I'm, not, I'm not into writing angry letters or lobbying politicians or, or whatever. I felt the only thing I could do about that was to try growing garlic myself. So, you know, to put this in context, the only growing ex experience I had up to, up to that um, 
uh, up to that point, I went through a sort of a phase in my 20s where I thought bonsai trees were the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> and I bought about six or seven of them and I killed them all. <laughs> <laughs> they had a, a collective age of about 3,000 years. And, uh, you know, so I, 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 t <laughs> I try, decided I was going to grow my, uh, grow my own garlic. So if, how many people in the room have grown garlic in the, in, in the past? Good few of you. So, you know, you, take, you literally take, this is the amazing thing about growing, you take the, the cloves, an individual clove from a bulb, and you stick that in the soil, and, you know, you put it just beneath the surface, and eventually it, it sends up a little shoot, and that becomes, you know, a stem. And, the, you know, so I, I think I planted 10 of them, and they, they, they kind of grew away in the corner. And, uh, you know, my, my anger over the Chinese garlic had long since subsided. Uh, and these things were growing away. And because I, you know, didn't, just hadn't a clue, I, I didn't even know. I thought, I kind of assumed that the, the bulb of garlic would grow on the top of the stem, you know, and that it'd be kind of flapping in the, <laughs> in the wind. <laughs> and uh, so nothing, ha you know, that didn't happen. It didn't just grow on top, of, on top of the stem. And then eventually, after, after maybe four or five months, it went, you know, the stem went sort of yellow and, and then brown, and then it fell over. And uh, that's actually garlic's way of telling you it's ready, it's ready to be eaten, you know, that there's a big bulb of garlic under the ground. But because I thought it was to grow on top, <laughs> I just thought it was dead. So I went into the shed and I took out my sh shiniest spade and I brought it out and went to dig this, these 10 uh, garlic uh, onto the, throw them on the compost heap, thinking, you know, so much for my righteous anger, this hasn't worked at all. And of course, out came 10 magnificent bulbs of garlic. You know, the biggest, I haven't gr managed to grow anything as good since, uh, incidentally. And just, you know, just an amazing experience. So that's my, my second road to Damascus moment, I guess, because I fi two things, I, I guess, occurred to me. First of all, that, you know, if I could do it with garlic, I could probably do it with leeks and carrots and other, and other veg. And then if I could do it and someone as patently clueless as me could do it, maybe lots of other people could do it. And if I could get, convince lots of people to do it, uh, potentially then we could, you know, start having uh, a pretty major impact on the problems we have in our food chain. Um, the garlic, garlic story has served me very well over the years, but what, what it represents uh, to me now is something much, much bigger. It's still sort of, you can still get it, I'm sure you, you, you can see, you'll see it yourself in supermarkets and so on now that you know what to look for. Um, but, but it still represents to me everything that's wrong with our, with our food chain. So, in Ireland, um, and the problems are the same here, if, if, if even on a bigger scale, uh, we import 5 billion euros worth of food every single year, which is bad in its own, in its, on its own. But at the same time as importing all that food, we export 7 billion euros worth of food. And there's particular types of food where we import exactly the same amount of food as we export. So think about it, you know, container ships passing each other in the Irish Sea, some bringing onions in, some sending onions out. We also produce, on an island with, you know, four million people, or six million on the island of Ireland, we produce enough food to feed, every single year, to feed 34 million people. So why, oh why, oh why, are we importing five billion euros worth of food when we can produce you know, all that food to feed ourselves seven, six, seven times over. And the answer, of course, is that our food chain now is not about feeding ourselves at all. It's not about self-sufficiency. It's just about trade. Um, and that's, that's the problem uh, that we need to fix. The impact that that has then is, is uh, you know, it's, it's bad enough in its own right. And obviously all the food miles and so on, very bad for the environment. But it's also you know, got a major impact on, on health, on human health. Because if you think about that garlic uh, that's, that's undergone that journey, that, that uh, you know, it's not at its healthiest, at its most nutritional. Um, uh, you know, the, the analogy I always use is if we got a articulated lorry to pull up outside the door here, and all, you know, 100 of us or 150 of us clambered into the back of it, and we ask the driver to, to bring us to China, drive us to China through all of the you know, uh, ports and the motorways we'd have to go on. Um, you know, what kind, of a, what kind of a state would we be in three weeks' time at the end of the journey? We're clearly not in very good shape to start, but... Uh, <laughs> we, 
we'd be even worse by the time we got there. And, and think about then the, the garlic doing that reverse journey and then expecting it or, you know, the, the industry calling it, you know, a touch of China, fresh, you know, this fresh, so-called fresh produce that we're getting. Um, so that, that's, that's the, uh, the issue that um, we need to really address. I want to talk to, you, talk to you about sweet corn. Many people have grown sweet corn in the, in the room. Yeah, quite a lot. Um, so this, this I picked on Thursday. It's looking a little bit worse for wear at this stage, but I grew this in my garden. And sweet corn is an amazing thing to grow. It's, it's, not, it's kind of difficult to grow well in, in, in this climate, obviously, when we don't have a huge amount of sun or heat we're, we're talking about. Um, but you can grow it um, you know, relatively well. And the thing I, thing I think we forget about sweet corn, because most of us, you know, the, we, we eat sweet corn in, you know, we've got, uh, you know, green giant, like the tins of sweet corn that you buy and so on. And we forget actually that each, each one of those little kernels is actually a seed. You know, you forget that that's what that's, what that's about. We just happen to eat it at that stage. Uh, but it's, you know, each one of those little sweet corn, if you take one of that, those kernels and stick it in a pot of compost, uh, in the springtime, say, it'll, you know, it'll germinate and produce a little plant, and then you take that plant out of the pot and put it into the soil, and it grows into a plant, you know, about that tall, uh, and then eventually, in, you know, September or October, in, in the axle between the sort of main stem and the little side stem, you see the way I've picked up all these great horticultural terms over the last <laughs> five years, axle. Uh, you, get, you get the sweet corn you know, sitting in that, in that sort of axle between the two. And you might get, you know, two of them or, or a few of them on if you're lucky. Um, and then, you know, again, one of these great things with nature, it's sort of a warning sign. So when, the, when this tassel on top goes brown, uh, that's, that's when you know it's ready to be, it's ready, ready to be picked. And you have, to te you have to sort of check then for freshness. You know the way when you buy fruit, you buy a big bowl of fruit and you put it in your kitchen and it's, you say it's pears and they're rock hard for, for two weeks and then, you know, in five seconds, they go from rock hard to mush. That ever happen to you? So the same with sweet corn. So you have to be really careful. So what you do is you pull back this sheath and you kind of, uh, which, are, which are, so you can see the little, all the little kernels in there. And you, you pierce one of them with your, with your, the, with your nail and you look at the liquid that comes out. So if it's really watery, it's not ready. And if it's really, really creamy and really thick, it's gone too far. And you're getting that, you're trying to get that stage in between which lasts for about 20 seconds. And, <laughs> and they, say, they say that when you, when, you, when you pick, you know, when it's ready to be picked, you should literally run from the vegetable patch into the kitchen and get it into a pot of water. Because what happens as soon as you pick it, it actually, the sugars inside it are starting to turn to starch, which means, you know, the taste and the nutrition are not as, are not as good. So literally within hours, uh, it's not, it's not going to be as tasty as it would have. So keep that in mind. And now we'll talk about this, which is, you know, what the food chain serves us up as fresh. So this is, you know, what you normally see, I guess, in the supermarket. You very rarely see those guys, but you do see a lot of these. And this is, we don't actually know where this was grown or when it was grown. It just says product of the EU. Um, it's got a best before date of the 4th of February, 2012. And I, I, so when I was going around the country or going around Ireland uh, setting up GIY groups, I used to, you know, I used to um, uh, bring this, bring one of these as a prop to talk about freshness and so on. And I brought, I brought the same one around to 70, launch, 70 GIY group launches over the space of a year. And it never went, it just wouldn't die. You know, it, it's in a state of perpetual sort of, I don't know, perpetual something. And then it just went, eventually just went black and, and I had to throw it out. And this is a different one. But this is what the food chain serves us up as fresh. And, you know, is there anybody in the room? And if the answer is yes, you can take this home and, and cook it for your supper that thinks that this is going to be as tasty or as nutritious as this? Of course not. Absolutely not, not a chance. But, but still, that's, you know, that's what we're dealing with in, in, in our food chain. When we talk about the problems that we have in, in the world, and in particularly in the food chain, and again, you know, some of the speakers <laughs> talked about this stuff yesterday, like what, how do you eat an elephant this size? You know, so, such, a, such an enormous problem 
um, what can I really do to what can I really do to fix it? And it's easy to get uh, to get sort of you know to despair. Um, I set up the first GIY group in Waterford literally just to try and inspire some other people uh, to, to start growing and help them to do so. And I set out 15 chairs in the local library. I was thinking if I got 10 people to come along, it would be great. Um, and we got a f 100 people showed up the first night. And it literally, people heard what we were doing and said, you know, can I set up a GIY group in my town? And we said, of course. And we, we set up a sort of a, a not-for-profit franchise, essentially, that we give to people. And as I said, it's, it's grown amazingly in Ireland. Um, I got a phone call about, about eight months ago from a woman in a town called Kalamunda in Western Australia. Came across us on the internet, said, can I set up a GIY group in my town? And we said, of course. We've got contact from, from people in San Diego. Um, last week I had an email from a woman in Southampton. I've spoken to people this weekend about hopefully starting groups in, in Wales. And basically, the, you know, what's exciting about this is we don't have to get 100% of the people to grow 100% of their own food. Because if we can get them to grow something, you know, even if it's just some herbs on a balcony or some salad leaves in a pot, their whole relationship with food changes. You know? So when they go to the supermarket to buy their stuff, and I still do as well because I'm, you know, as, you, as, as is obvious, I'm not a great grower. Um, so when I go to the supermarket, I think differently about the food I'm going to buy. So I buy more seasonal food, I buy more organic food. I know if I see one of these in the supermarket in March, it's not in season, and, though, and so you don't buy it. So that's the potential of this project, I suppose, and, and the potential of getting people to grow some of their own food is that if we can get enough people to make a personal commitment to grow some of their own food, then we can have an absolutely massive impact on the problems in our food chain from the bottom up instead of from the top down. Um, and that's, that's, I think, how you eat an elephant is uh, one GIYer at a time, as we, as we say. We're um, unashamedly mass market. We don't try to say to people, you have to grow organically, because people, you know, the people that are going to grow their own food aren't going to go out and spray their crops with, with chemicals. Um, you know, we try to keep the message really simple. Just start, uh, try, give it a try, grow something that you can eat. So my big do, I suppose, is that, that we can uh, change the world one person at a time. My medium-sized do, I, I have, to be, have to be contrary and stubborn and have three do's instead of two. Um, so my medium-sized do is to you know, start a GIY group in your area. If you're interested, come talk to us. We'd be absolutely delighted to help you out. And my little do is, is for every single person in this room to go so, sow a seed if you, haven't, if you haven't ever done so in the past. You know, don't be afraid of it. It's the, it's the most simple thing in the world. And don't leave it till next spring either, because there's still things you can sow at this time of the year. You can sow, you know, oriental salads. You can sow, um, you know, any of the great winter greens like spinach and chard and so on. Um, you know, so get yourself a pot this week, this week or this week, next weekend. Get some compost, sow a seed in it, and just give it a try. People are daunted by it for no reason, because the worst thing that can happen is that it doesn't grow. And in the scheme of the problems we have in the world today, I think that's not, not a huge deal. So just give, give it a try uh, and see what, see what happens. The last point I suppose I leave you with is just to say, you know, again, um, in Christiana's talk yesterday, she talked about this animal rights activist that she met um, who said she, you know, she wouldn't be happy until every animal was free of, of, of human enslavement, I think was the, was the phrase. And, you know, I, I sort of think about our, our ultimate mission, I suppose, as an organization is to, is to have a world where homegrown food is the norm rather than the exception. And clearly, if my happiness is tied up in that, I'm not going to be happy for a very, very long time. Um, so, you know, enjoy the bites. Life is, is, uh, is a journey and not a destination. So enjoy every, all the bits along the way. Um, my contact details are there. A suitably uh, cliched slogan, I think, uh, to finish up with. So thank you very much for your time.